earliest memory of learning Shakespeare was when I was 14 years old, so I was in year 10. I remember we watched a little film in English class directed by Kenneth Branagh and starring himself and Emma Thompson in the principal roles of Benedict and Beatrice. And that film was this version of the play Must Do About Nothing by William Shakespeare. I know that we had learned a tiny bit of Shakespeare before this, but this was the first time we were properly delving into the bard himself. And I'm bringing up this memory because it was so monumental in my learning to love Shakespeare. It was the first Shakespeare play in film that I ever saw, but more importantly, it was the first one in film that I saw that stayed true to the original script and language. And I know this because when we was watching it, we also had the script on our desk and we was going through line by line and obviously they were changing things here and there, pulling things out for time, making things longer for comedic effect, changing things here and there. But ultimately they tried to stay as close to the original script by Shakespeare and time period as they could. And I really admire that because that's how I prefer to digest my Shakespeare. And even to this day, I can't say exactly what it was, but I was completely enraptured by this film. It made me fall in love with Shakespeare, become utterly obsessed with Shakespeare and his literature, and most importantly, start reading more of his work. To this day, I have four Shakespeare play posters on my wall. I have a quote in a frame. I have that same quote on a pillow. I have books upon books on Shakespeare. I have a poster sitting here of the Almeida Theatre production of Hamlet that I saw three times. I've seen two Shakespeare plays in the Globe, and I've probably read most, if not all of, his plays and sonnets and I've even got a couple sonnets memorised and it all stems from this moment, this play and this film in English class when I was 14 years old. I think Shakespeare has a lot to do with my choosing to do a creative writing and English literature course for university because even then I was one of few if any that completely love getting to grips with this archaic language, analysing line by line, figuring out what it meant, investigating the time period that it was, the context, all of that jazz. And obviously when you're 14 years old and you're thrust onto Shakespeare, you don't understand the language at first. It takes time, it is a practice, it is an art to learn it. But from 14 years old to now, I can safely say that if you was to hand me any Shakespeare play, I could understand the language at the drop of a pin. And that is through years of studying the language and himself and his plays. I also took an entire module dedicated to Shakespeare my second year of university. And I hope to do Shakespeare studies as my master's degree in a few years time. If all of that doesn't tell you how much I absolutely love Shakespeare, I'm not sure what will. So as a dedication to my love of his literature, his plays, his sonnets, him as an artist, and because I want to learn even more about this man I absolutely adore, the enigma and mystery surrounding him and his work, I decided to create this series on Shakespeare and share that knowledge in video format. I have another series on this channel called A Trip Through Time Philosophy Edition whereby I go through different philosophers and their philosophies from the earliest examples to modern examples of philosophers and I hope to do the same thing with this Shakespeare series. I'm going to go through a timeline of his plays and sonnets from the earliest examples of his writing, the earliest releases of his plays to later releases and of course we don't know exactly when these plays were written and performed but there is a rough timeline out there and I'm just going to be going with that timeline for clarity's sake. Along with these videos on his plays and sonnets I also would like to talk about their adaptations, discuss more on the legend and mystery that surrounds Shakespeare and maybe even a whole video on the conspiracies surrounding him because I know there are loads such as the one that he didn't exist at all or that someone else namely Christopher Marlowe wrote all of his plays but the conspiracy is interesting nonetheless. Despite that long introduction that I'm going to try and shorten as much as I can, today's video is a discussion on Shakespeare's life from birth to death, the theatre scene during the late 16th and 17th century, monarchy's history because during Shakespeare's career he went through being under Elizabeth I's reign to James VI of Scotland's reign. So his plays are sometimes split between Elizabethan and Jacobian and most importantly how he became the writer we know and love today. This is going to be a hell of a long video and I'm still certain I'm bound to have missed bits out but let's get started nonetheless and I hope this can serve as a very comprehensive guide to his life. So 
William Shakespeare is regarded as the greatest and most imaginative writer in English language's history. He was a poet of two narrative poems and 154 sonnets, an actor and above all a dramatist, a playwright of almost 40 plays. This is his story. William Shakespeare was born in April of 1564 and baptised in Holy Trinity Church in Stratford-upon-Avon in England on the 26th of April that same year. While his exact birthday is unknown, as are the exact dates of many of his plays written completion, his birthday has been universally celebrated on the 23rd of April since around the 18th century. His father was a man named John Shakespeare who came from farming stock but at 20 years old moved to Stratford in order to work as a Wittawa and Glover. Four years after his move he married Mary Arden, Shakespeare's mother. It's actually thought that the two knew each other from childhood because John's father, Richard Shakespeare, was a tenant farmer on land owned by Mary's father. Unlike John's background in farming, Mary had a much more distinguished family history with the traces back to the Norman Conquest. Thomas Arden fought in the 13th century civil war, Robert Arden fought in the War of the Roses, and John Arden was one of Henry VII's courtiers. Mary was a daughter of the landed class, much different to John. Throughout their lives, John and Mary had eight children in total. Before William was born, John and Mary had two daughters who died in infancy named Joan and Margaret. William came along, so he is the oldest of all of his siblings, minus the two that passed away. When he was born, he and his parents lived on Henley Street, now known as and regarded as Shakespeare's birthplace. After William was born, John and Mary went on to have two more daughters and three more sons, Joan, Anne, Gilbert, Richard and Edmund. William was the oldest and Edmund was the youngest at 16 years, Shakespeare's junior. Edmund also went on to be an actor in London before his untimely death at 27 years old. In 1568, church going was a requirement by the law, so William would have then been familiar with the Bible, the Book of Prayer and the sermons, as these would have been taught both at church and at home. And I mention this because this knowledge of religion is apparent in many of his writings. Stratford-upon-Avon, where Shakespeare was born and lived, was a market town with a superb church, an established grammar school for boys, nice houses and wealthy and educated townsmen. It was the ideal place for him to grow up. While unfortunately a lot of school records are lost from that time, we do know that William attended King Edward VI school and his writings reflect this standard of education at the time. This is juxtaposed with both his parents who were possibly both illiterate due to John's background and Mary being a woman. If you're unaware, Grammar schools and schools at that time were strictly for boys. Women were not allowed to get an education. Interestingly, these schools taught literature at a level that is similar to university level classics today. So really hardcore from a really early age. The boys at the school were required to both write and speak Latin. And so William could quote entire passages of textbooks. In fact, this is most notable in a scene from one of his plays, The Merry Wives of Windsor, whereby a boy named William is in Latin grammar class and must recite a book that was actually used in all grammar schools at the time. It is seen as the most autobiographical scene that Shakespeare ever wrote. During his youth, touring companies would often visit Stratford and he had the opportunity to both attend and act in plays in the Guildhall. This is possibly when his love of drama began, just as a young boy. With no certainty, it is thought or it is probable that he left school at 15 and worked with his father in his workshop. From the ages of 15 to 18, we don't really know what he did for a living. But in 1582, when he was 18 years old, he married Anne Hathaway, who was 26 at the time. In terms of his family life, it all kind of stems here. Six months later, their newborn daughter Susanna was baptised, and following this, they had twins, Hamnet and Judith, in late January, early February of 1585. Unfortunately, though, Hamnet died one year later, However, his grave location is actually unknown. After this, they had no more children. So Shakespeare's only children were Hamnet, Susanna and Judith. Now, here's actually where it gets complicated. I'm talking about his early life up to his marrying of Anne Hathaway and his children and family life. But there is now a gap 
between the birth of his twins in 1585 up to 1592. We cannot be sure what exactly he did between these years. 1592 was actually when his name first appeared in print, so that's when we know his career was flowing. But this does mean that there are seven years unknown in which we can only speculate what his life looked like. There are a lot of speculations. Some speculate that he joined a theatre company as an actor, writer, or even as both. Others believe he was a school teacher during this time. There is even a specific rumour that he travelled to Italy. Another speculation, which I find really fascinating, is that it's believed that Shakespeare had Catholic sympathies that he had to keep secret from the current monarchy's Protestant reign. So if you're unaware, Henry VIII changed the reign from Catholic to Protestant church. And there were a lot of people that still sympathised with the Catholic Church. Shakespeare possibly could have been one of them, but you were prosecuted. I'll talk more on this later, but whatever the case may be that he did between 1585 to 1592, his wife and children stayed in Stratford the whole time of his career. We know for certain that by 1590, Shakespeare was living and writing plays in London. So it is thought that in 1589, Shakespeare officially arrived in London. We know he was writing at this time because he was beginning to gain a reputation as an annoyance to the university educated literary dramatists. An example of this is that a playwright named Robert Breen wrote quite bitterly about Shakespeare before he died in poverty in 1592, calling Shakespeare an upstart crow in the following passage. For there is an upstart crow, beautified with our feathers, that with his tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide supposes he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of us and is in his own conceit the only shake scene in a country. So to pick apart this quote really quick, the use of tiger's heart wrapped in a player's hide is actually a parody of a line from Henry the Sixth, part three. So we know he's written this by now because if Robert Greene's written about it in 1592, it's out by this point. He also mimics his name Shakespeare by the use of shake scene and he thinks he is a fool to think he can write as well as them in the quote suppose he is as well able to bombast out a blank verse as the best of you just because Shakespeare isn't university educated he thinks Shakespeare can't write as well as them look how well Frim did it so if an educated dramatist such as Green knew of Shakespeare's work especially enough to quote from Henry the sixth part three then it is evident that he was both becoming well known yet still sufficiently new to the scene hence green's use of the word upstart fun fact as well while we're on the topic of upstart crow there is actually a sitcom about shakespeare by that same name upstart crow made by and starring david mitchell so a quick monarchy history lesson and i don't want to go on too many tangents during this video but this is important around this time henry the eighth broke from the catholic church this change was still very raw and sympathisers with the Catholic Church still remained, as I was saying earlier. And these people were monitored by the government because you don't want people not following the king's rule. Catholic Mary Queen of Scots, who had long been imprisoned after a plot to kill her cousin Queen Elizabeth I emerged, in 1587 she was actually executed. And this set off a chain of events. For example, her husband, Philip II of Spain, sent the 140 ship Armada, the aim to 1. Avenge his wife, 2. Invade England, 3. Depose Elizabeth, and 4. Restore the Catholic faith that Mary followed. The Armada was seen as the greatest fleet that ever swam, and I'm sure you've heard of that name. And yet it was the smaller English fleet that routed the Armada. The English won against all odds, stopping this invasion. And this unlikely triumph sent a wave of patriotism throughout England, both Catholic and Protestant alike. Everyone was just so patriotic at this time. So why is this important? Well, because Shakespeare is known to have wrote many history plays. It is thought that this patriotic wave beating the Armada was the inspiration for his raft of history plays, such as Richard II, for an example. Back to 1589, however, this was a really exciting time to be a playwright in London. The arts of music, painting, architecture and literature were flourishing. It was the fastest growing city in Europe at the time. It was becoming a bustling metropolis. It had a population made of under 30s, making it a very young city. And the theatre scene at this time was 
exploding. And it is also thought that the Two Gentlemen of Verona, what is deemed Shakespeare's first play, was written in this year. But two examples of this theatre scene exploding are seen in James Burbage's theatre in Shoreditch, erected in 1576, and Philip Henslow's The Curtain Theatre, which was built nearby in 1577. I mention this as it's thought that Shakespeare may have started a career as an actor with one of these companies and then wrote soon thereafter. But again, we cannot be sure of this, purely speculation. So following the dangerous times of the looming but obviously failed invasion from Philip II of Spain, a plague then ravaged London in 1592. Now, it's not the plague that you might be thinking of. That plague, also known as the Black Death, happened in 1665, so long after Shakespeare died. This plague was just a different plague, much smaller in scale, considering the Black Death. During this plague, the theatres were closed from June 1592 to May 1594, and theatre companies were completely banished from the city. Again, it's not known for certain what Shakespeare did during these years when he couldn't act or perform with the theatres being shut but it is possible he wrote a lot of his poetry in 1593 because firstly, his sonnets are actually dated as being written between 1593 to 1603. And secondly, he published one of his great narrative poems, Venus and Adonis in 1593. Surprisingly enough, and something that I had no idea of, I always thought his plays were his biggest successes, but this narrative poem was the biggest literary success of his entire life. The following year, in 1594, he published his second narrative poem, which was The Rape of Lucretia. I have to say, however, the possibility of why his poems were so much more successful in terms of literary success than his plays is because they were reprinted much more than his plays. And this is in part because plays were written to be acted and seen rather than read, whereas poetry was strictly to be read. During the two year gap while the theatres were closed, alongside his writing poetry, it is thought that Shakespeare anticipated this resurgence and need for entertainment once the theatres were back open, hence why his next two plays were comedies, Love Labour's Lost and The Comedy of Errors. So this time period from 1589 to 1594 is usually considered Shakespeare's freelance writing period. So just to quickly go over the, what he wrote from 1589 to 1594, it is presumed that Shakespeare wrote in this order, the comedy, The Two Gentlemen of Verona in 1589, his first ever play. Tragic comedy, The Taming of the Shrew in 1590. History play, Henry VI, Part Two in 1590. The history play, Henry VI, Part Three in 1591. The history play, Henry VI, Part One in 1591. Tragedy, Titus Andronicus in 1591. The history play, Richard III in 1592, before the play. Also the history play, Edward III in 1592, before the play. The narrative poem, Venus and Adonis in 1593. The narrative poem, The Rape of Lucretia in 1594. Comedy, Love Labour's Lost in 1594. And the comedy, The Comedy of Errors in 1594. Following the reopening of the theatres in 1594, the success of his poems beforehand meant that he could engineer a secure position in the theatre world as a writer, letting his successful writing speak for itself in his abilities. At the same time of the theatre's reopening in 1594, a man named Lord Hunsdon, the Lord Chamberlain, reconstituted his theatre company by the name of the Lord Chamberlain's Men. Of course, Shakespeare became a part of this company because he had already set up his status as a writer in a way in a small way because of the success of his poems alongside Shakespeare was tragedy actor Richard Burbage and clown William Kempe both of which would launch some of Shakespeare's greatest archetype roles I know for certain that William Kempe originated the character of Falstaff and it's strange to think that these two actors two friends of his were the first people to play such grand and famous roles now even more interesting is the fact that they didn't know it at the time. A typical company at the time was made up of 12 to 14 men with extras known as hired men. And of course, women performers were not allowed at this time. If they weren't allowed to get an education, they certainly weren't allowed to be performers. In fact, women performers were not allowed before 1660. This possibly explains why there are such small numbers of female characters in Shakespeare's plays, because men had to play the female roles too. And they either weren't happy with playing the female roles 
or Shakespeare wasn't happy with them playing the female roles because he wanted his plays to be as realistic and lifelike as possible maybe that's just one theory for example I think in Hamlet it's just Gertrude and Ophelia they're the only two female characters at this time Shakespeare was also more free to write independently what he wanted before this he was doing a couple of collaborations but now he was free to write the plays that he wanted on his own. In 1596, the mayor bans actors from the city for a short time, and so they had to stay outside the city walls with their performances. That same year, Shakespeare was granted a coat of arms and the status of a gentleman. Not just Shakespeare that was granted the coat of arms, but the Shakespeare name, the Shakespeare family. The theatre ban from 1596 didn't hold up long, and it was lifted in 1597, just a year later. Lead actors in the company, the Lord Chamberlain's men, all owned shared. Shakespeare held a 10% stake, which ensured that he earned 200 to 700 pound a year, which is a lot in that time. And compared to other playwrights' earnings, it was a lot. Shakespeare also rented various places to live in London, and in 1597, he was able to buy his family a house in Stratford. So even though they were there and he was in London, he still cared for them and he set them up nicely. The company gave him a platform for his plays. And over the next nine years, up to 1602, he wrote 17 plays. So just imagine at this time, he's an emerging writer. Suddenly he's part of a company. He can write whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Par the censorship that I'll talk about a bit later. And he's got a place for his writings to be performed with a company of people ready to perform them. He was able to do this because he spent those two years when the theatres were closed really honing his writing, poetic and dramatic skills. Again, we can't date these 17 plays exactly. However, something I found really interesting was that a book was released in 1598 by Francis Merries that lists multiple of his plays. For those plays to have been listed, he must have known about them, meaning that they was released at that time. They must have been released by the year of 1598 in order for Francis Merries to cite them in his book. So although we don't know the exact dates, we know that the plays mentioned in his book were written before 1598. It was also in 1598 that Shakespeare's name became a selling point as it appeared on the title pages of the quarto editions of his plays, which were just publications of a few of his plays. I'll be talking more on the plays that Francis Morez quotes in his book a bit later on as well. At this point in theatre, censorship was an issue as authorities were keen to control what they seemed to be salacious or inappropriate entertainment. And I'm going to come back to this in just a few moments. In 1598, the Shoreditch Playhouse, called The Theatre, was torn down and Shakespeare's company secretly carried the disassembled timber from that theatre building over the river to Southwark to erect a new theatre, their theatre. And if you know a bit about Shakespeare, you may know where I'm going for this. This theatre was the Globe Theatre. Its opening year was in 1599, just a year later. And this is where censorship comes back into play. Actors faced daily battles to get scripts past the Master of Revels. His job was to be responsible for vetting every play. It couldn't have challenging political writing, Shakespeare's specialty. It couldn't parody the monarchy, or anything else that they deemed inappropriate, really. They could scrap out whatever they wanted. In one instance, severe cuts were made to a play co-authored by Shakespeare and many other writers. This play was called Sir Thomas More. The play portrays the Chancellor of Henry VIII refusing him a divorce. And this play was probably never staged because of both the severe cuts and because the car size was ultimately too large to stage, especially with the numbers in their company. It couldn't be done. I mentioned Shakespeare's specialty being challenging political writing and the Lord Chamberlain's men were not afraid of political controversy. It's even been thought that Shakespeare stuffed his plays with coded symbols in order to evade censorship but convey a Catholic message to those who understood. Again, coming back to that theory that Shakespeare had Catholic sympathies and had to hide them from the government. The idea of coded messages within his work is possibly the reason his plays are still analysed by scholars today. You don't know what we could be missing in his plays that are actually coded messages or symbolism or underlying messages. A really interesting point of interest regarding censorship actually is that in February 1601, the Earl of Essex requested a special performance of Richard II, including scenes originally censored and unpublished at the time. These scenes included 
the monarch deposed and murdered. And I don't know if it was a plan by the Earl because he knew what was in those scenes or this happened because he watched it. But ultimately, after the performance, the Earl led a small army to Whitehall Palace to attempt to bring down the Queen and to replace her with James VI. This attempt failed and ended with the Earl's execution. So this could be a really poor reflection of Shakespeare and awkwardly kind of proves censorship's point slightly. But again, did he do this because he watched the play or did he know about the scenes that were cut and just wanted to put them on anyway and just wanted to watch it to kind of feel better about his plan. Luckily though, the company did manage to escape punishment or any consequences for this performance. They got away scot-free. Also in 1601, Shakespeare's dad died at more than 70 years of age, which is actually amazing and impressive for that period. And he was buried in Stratford. So I mentioned earlier that he wrote 17 plays between 1594 to 1602. This period is oftentimes looked at as Shakespeare's The Lord Chamberlain's Men period. Spoke about Comedy of Errors and Love Labour's Lost earlier in 1594. So disregarding them onwards, he wrote the history play Richard II in 1595, the tragedy Romeo and Juliet in 1595, the comedy A Midsummer Night's Dream in 1595, the history play The Life and Death of King John in 1596, the comedy The Merchant of Venice in 1596, the history Henry IV Part I in 1596, the comedy Much Ado About Nothing, my fave, in 1598, the history Henry V in 1599, the tragedy Julius Caesar in 1599, the tragedy Hamlet from 1599 to 1601, that date is really uncertain, the comedy Twelfth Night in 1601, and the tragedy Troilus and Cressida in 1602. On the 24th of March 1603, Elizabeth I died after 45 years on the throne. And this is the difference between the Elizabethan era and the Jacobian era of Shakespeare's writing. So Elizabeth I was succeeded by her cousin James VI of Scotland and he would reign over the last years of Shakespeare's life. Elizabeth was a fan of Shakespeare's and so was James. In fact, one of his first acts as king was to give Shakespeare's company a royal patent and they moved from the Lord Chamberlain's men to the King's men. From this point and for 13 years up until Shakespeare's death, the King's men performed for the court 187 times, which works out to more than once a month. When James became king, as well as a whole monarchy's reign coming to an end, Shakespeare moved away from his more light-hearted comedies, romances and histories and dove into much darker and grander plays. This type of play would thus dictate James's reign, whereas the previous style dictated Elizabeth's reign. In the first three years of James's reign, so 1603 to 1606, Shakespeare wrote six plays, five of which were ambitious tragedies. These were Othello, King Lear, Macbeth, Antony and Cleopatra and Timon of Athens. The sixth play was Measure for Measure, which is a comedy, but even that was intense and morally challenging. And if you've read even one of those plays, you know it's a very dark period here. Three of the plays that I just mentioned are within the canon of what is deemed his four greatest tragedies, and they are Othello, King Lear and Macbeth. Hamlet completes this list, but was written earlier in 1601. While he wrote these plays, the Globe was still performing all the time because it had his backlog of plays already written to perform and keep audiences full and obviously keep that money coming in. So now he really had the luxury to write. Plays of his were being performed all the time at the Globe. Audiences were still full, so he was still getting paid. In 1604, he rented a room in the house of a Christopher Mountjoy. We know this thanks to Shakespeare's mention in legal documents from a lawsuit that was made against Mountjoy by his son-in-law. And that's just a throwaway fact about where Shakespeare was in 1604. However, because Shakespeare was both a name now and because he was much older than when he first moved to London and it was a young city, 
he had the luxury to go home to Stratford whenever he wanted to write in a much calmer environment than the busy city and I expect he took advantage of this a lot. Another monumental historical event that occurred at this time was Gunpowder Plot which took place on the 5th of November 1605. This is now celebrated in the UK as Bonfire Night or Fireworks Night whichever title you prefer on the same date. Gunpowder Plot for those unaware is when a man called Guy Fawkes attempted to blow up the Houses of Parliament and this is an example of religion going too far. He had Catholic sympathies in a Protestant reign, so attempted to blow up the entire Houses of Parliament. Thankfully, though, he was foiled because someone tipped off the guards that he was there. If he hadn't been stopped, however, the 36 barrels of gunpowder that he had would have destroyed both Parliament and Whitehall Palace. It would have killed the entire royal family. As well. Interestingly, I bring this up because of the time period and because a distant relative of Shakespeare, a man named Robert Cattersby, was involved in this attempt to destroy Protestant government. And when this plot was foiled, this was the straw that broke the camel's back, as the saying goes. It ended the Catholic challenge to the Protestant reign. In 1607, Shakespeare's daughter, Susanna, married physician John Hall, and they had a daughter named Elizabeth, but more on this later. However, back to Shakespeare directly and his story. The King's Men continued to prosper, and in 1608, acquired a new theatre. This theatre was the Blackfriars. The opening of this theatre was initially delayed, however, because of a new plague, but had its opening shortly thereafter. This theatre was the polar opposite to the Globe because firstly it was an indoor theatre whereas the Globe is famously outdoors as were most of the theatres at the time and secondly it was much smaller than the Globe, much more intimate space. Because it was indoors it was obviously closed off from natural light so the performances took place by candlelight which is still the case at the Sam Wanamaka Playhouse today which took its design inspiration and layout from the Blackfriars Theatre all those years ago. And now the Sam Wanamaka Playhouse plays Shakespeare alongside the globe. So history really does it repeat itself. Now they had the opportunity to perform all year round. We have to remember the time era as well. So, you know, radiators, heat warmers, thick layers weren't really an option back then. So now they really did have the opportunity to perform all year round for the comfort of everyone using the globe for the summer and the Blackfriars for the winter. Also, because of the use of candles, doing the performances by a candlelight, this meant frequent trimmings needed to be made to, in order to keep the candles alight. And so writers began to divide their plays, most notably the five-act play structure developed, which is what a lot of playwrights use to structure their plays to this day. And that's where it developed from and why it had to develop. So due to the intimate space of the Blackfriars, Shakespeare began to write plays more suited to this space and what could be done with it. He could now play with the ability for spectacular theatrical effects that could be manipulated. For example, the storm in The Tempest or the living statue in A Winter's Tale. During this time, while he was experimenting with what could be done with theatre and writing, he also returned to collaborating with other playwrights as he had done earlier in his career, like I mentioned earlier, with other emerging dramatists such as Christopher Marlowe. Now, however, he worked with the likes of Thomas Middleton on Pericles in 1607 and John Fletcher on Two Noble Kinsmen in 1613 and Two Noble Kinsmen is actually considered his last play. At this time, playwright Ben Johnson had also emerged on the scene as Shakespeare's most serious rival. So it was now Shakespeare, Ben Johnson and Thomas Middleton who he worked with on Pericles, kind of the top dramatists out there. Obviously though, Shakespeare still held the number one spot. 29th of June, 1613, the Globe Theatre famously caught fire during a performance of Henry VIII. Cannon prop misfired and set the thatched roof alight. The theatre burned down, but thankfully no one was harmed. And as art imitates life, it seems like this theatre and Shakespeare ended near the same time, quite fittingly really, as it had homed some of his greatest successes. Shakespeare never got to work in the Globe again from this point forward, as he died just three short years later. From this point forward, all we know is that Shakespeare wrote nothing more and died three years later on the 23rd of April, 1616, in his home in Stratford at only 52 years old. So just to backtrack a bit, 
to talk about and focus on the plays written in this final period. This period is normally labelled as Shakespeare's the King's Men period, era, whatever you want to call it, uh, the final period of his life. So from 1603 to his death in 1616, his plays were Comedy, Measure for Measure in 1603, The Tragedy, Othello in 1603, The Tragedy, King Lear in 1605, the Tragedy Timon of Athens in 1605, The Tragedy Macbeth in 1606, The Tragedy Antony and Cleopatra in 1606, The Comedy All's Well That Ends Well in 1606, The Tragicomedy Pericles in 1607, The Tragedy Coriolanus in 1608, The Comedy Winter's Tao in 1609, the first collection of his 154 sonnets were also published by A. Thomas Thorpe in 1609, although it's thought that his sonnets were written between 1593 to 1603. This was the first publication of all 154 sonnets. Tragedy Cymbeline in 1610, the comedy The Tempest in 1610, and this is actually thought to be the last play he wrote alone. The history Henry VIII, also known as All is True in 1613, and finally, the tragic comedy, The Two Noble Kinsmen in 1613. Earlier on, I told you I'd be coming back to Shakespeare's daughter, Susanna's daughter, Elizabeth Hall. And that is because Hall died in 1670 and she was actually the last direct descendant of Shakespeare. So with her death, I feel like that concludes the life and times of William Shakespeare, or at least what we know of it. So there's just a few more things I want to go over post Shakespeare's death. The first thing is that throughout this video, when I have spoken about his plays, you have heard me use one of three genres, tragedy, comedy or history. These three classifications are the same ones used in the first folio. Throughout the video, I've also used the term tragicomedy, which is a subgenre that emerged later on after the publication of the first folio. It's a mixture of tragedy and comedy. It can't be defined by one genre. Other subgenres of his work have also emerged and been put forward, such as romantic comedies and historical tragic comedies. Any way that you can switch around and link the three genres, it has been done and it has been posed. Some people even said after the first folio's release in 1623 that romance should be a category all on its own. The categories of his plays are still debated on today with arguments for all sides. However, I decided to stick with the first folio classifications for this video just for clarity's sake. They're the genres most people know and go with associated with each particular play. So just for clarity's sake, I've stuck with them ones. I'm not going to get into the debate over what genres are which for which play. So if you're unaware of what I mean by the first folio, this was the first full publication of all of his works compiled in one publication. And this was compiled by two of his fellow actors in the Lord Chamberlain's Men, John Hemmings and Henry Condell, and it was published in 1623. So a folio is parchment bound to create two leaves, so four pages of a volume. Remember, the publishing industry was not what it is today, and publishing was much more complex to do back then without our technology. I'll probably do a whole video just on publishing back then, but today's not the video for it. Regrettably, Shakespeare never got to oversee the full publication of his life's work. We are lucky that his friend Condell and Hemmings decided to collect and publish his work. Otherwise, many more of his great plays and sonnets may be lost today, as others are thought to have been. There are possibly dozens upon dozens of lost plays or lost ideas for plays and sonnets that never saw the light of day, and so we'll never know about them because they are just lost. One of these is a play called Love Labours One, which is thought to have been, I can't remember if it's a prequel or a sequel to Love Labours Lost, but it's believed that, that was written and lost. The two wrote two messages in the front of the folio. There was a letter to the reader and then a poem about Shakespeare. But in their message to the reader, the pair quote, it had been a thing we confess worthy to have been wished that the author himself had lived to have set forth and overseen his own writings. Both of them wish he'd lived long enough to oversee the first folio, but because he couldn't, and because he didn't, they took it upon themselves to do it for him, believing it to be a wish of his, I guess. In their poem about Shakespeare, Condell and Hemmings describe him as thou art a monument without a tomb. And in the pictures that I inserted, the spelling is off. For example, an S is written kind of like this. Uh, and that is because there is no standard of spelling 
at the time so they could change up how they spelt things as and when they saw fit they could add an e they could add an a however they thought it sounded that's how they would write it a lot of people take this as evidence of shakespeare not being real or being written by someone else because he would spell his name different all the time but it's because there was no standard spelling at the time so his name is spelt different because he would just choose to write it differently but back to that quote thou art a monument without a tomb even then, in 1623, they knew that Shakespeare would be timeless. He will be remembered always, and his writing and himself and his legacy will live on. He can never die. They also stress the importance to read him, therefore, and again and again. And if then you do not like him, surely you are in some manifest danger not to understand him. They knew that he needed to be learned. I mentioned way back at the beginning of this video in my introduction that... I had to really study him in depth to understand the full extent of his plays and his language. And they say it here, if you can't understand him, you are in a danger. You need to work at it, read it again and again to get to grips because without Shakespeare, your life lacks something. It's actually ironic to look back now at this quote and think today that all schools teach Shakespeare. People are encouraged to understand and appreciate the work of the Bard, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, literary mind in history. Shakespeare is a long dead playwright who wrote in a very different time to us about very different things in an archaic language many find difficult to understand at first glance, and he employed unrealistic dramatic conventions. Some people question why we still focus on him and teach him in schools. The answer is that he was a versatile playwright who experimented constantly with new styles of drama, developed his subject matter and characters, innovated the English language. He was a master of prose, poetry, verse, language and humanity. He wrote beautiful passages, witty and comic speeches, gripping stories, twisted tales, raw and individual characters, and could write both with simplicity and extravagance. He was a master of storytelling and paved the way for the future of literature. Plays are somehow timeless, managing to relate to issues in modern day with political dimensions, and they could communicate just about anything about human psyche and morality. The roles he has written provide a wealth of complexities that allow actors the exceptional opportunities to demonstrate their skills. There's nothing really quite like it. He is not just a playwright, but a poet and a philosopher. In short, the greatest writer to ever live and who will never die. That is the story of William Shakespeare.